best in life. Crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and they hear the lamentation of your women. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Geek Fest Rants. Today we have a special episode. Joining us today is Mike Sutton. He's been here a couple times before. And the topic today is the film Conan the Barbarian. This is one of Mike's favorite films, possibly his favorite film. What do you what do you think, Mike? Is it? It's definitely in the top five. Tell me a little bit about how you ever heard of Conan before the movie came out. What did you know Conan was before you ever saw the movie? When it came out and you saw the trailers on TV, you know, I was a comic book collector. That's when I was starting out. It was a Marvel Comics comic book line. And hey, they're making a movie out of it. So that's what kind of pulled me into it. Just being barbarians and I was playing D&D back as a kid. So, you know, it just all made sense at the time. And then I ended up loving the movie, mm-hmm. coming out of it and watching it and the music, everything. Well, the comic book connection, from what I understand, is pretty important. And not just the fact that it came from a comic, but apparently from what we've seen in some of these documentaries we've watched, the first writers of the film, the first draft of the film was written by the actual writers of the comic. Yeah. Roy Thomas was the uh, writer for Marvel Comics. Uh, He wrote a lot of the early issues and he did a, a long run. I don't remember exactly how long. But he was on that book for a long time. Apparently, also, obviously with these films, they don't always end up the way that they start. A couple of people, from what I understand, took a shot at the script. After the writers of the comic book did their first draft, out of all people in the world, Oliver Stone got involved in this film. Now, you got to keep in mind, the year is probably 1981. It's a year before the movie comes out. And Oliver Stone is not the Oliver Stone that was back in the mid-1980s. He hadn't shot Platoon yet. He might have done one independent film here or there but so he wasn't a really big deal his big claim to fame i think in the late 70s and the early 80s was probably midnight express he wrote i think midnight express so he had no director really big director credentials so in the industry he was known as a pretty good writer so i imagine that's maybe how he got involved now do you remember how his script differed from first draft to second draft in terms of what he added to it that made it a little different i think he was looking for more sorcery and devils and demons more true to the uh, robert e howard type books that's what he was looking at that was his grand idea and, and obviously it changed as the final movie came out when John Milius came in, when he was picked as a director to start writing it. Right. I remember they were mentioning the fact that he was envisioning almost like a James Bond series type of thing where you have 9, 10, 12 different chapters and every couple of years you come out with a new one. You know, that kind of a franchise, which I guess back then the only franchise that existed was James Bond. I mean, even Star Wars was kind of young still back then. You only had two movies. But yeah, his interpretation seemed to be more in the, you know, sword and sorcery, more sorcery than sword, I guess. And from what I understand, at that time, when they were shopping around for who could direct this, they were interviewing people like Ridley Scott and Alan Parker, you know, people that, at at that time, they were pretty hot directors. Ridley Scott was coming off of Alien and probably starting to work or considering working on Blade Runner. Same thing with Alan Parker. He had his big hits. And he was a hot commodity back then. So uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he got involved in Pink Floyd's The Wall back then. That was his next big film in the early 80s. And then at a certain point, I guess the producers, it it seemed like they got a little worried that they weren't sure who was going to make this. So they apparently sold the rights or or bargained the rights to Dino De Laurentiis to let him kind of make the film. And in the process, apparently let him find somebody else to probably even rewrite it or punch it up some more. And that's how John Milius got involved, right? Correct. Yeah, I think Dino De Laurentiis was interested. Let's get the producer, since he was a producer, Mm -hmm. who's the director? Who am I going to get in there to look at the script and see if they can make any changes? Because, again, I think it was just too big. I think it would just be a little too extravagant back in the 80s right. to create a movie with all these devils and demons and actually hordes of devils and demons. You know? Also, De Laurentiis at the time, he was known. I mean, I think, didn't he do King Kong? Yeah, he did that awful remake of King Kong. But as a kid, I liked it. Now I look at it and I say it's bad when you but dissect it. he wasn't like that much but, of a big shot, at least in the States. He's, he's uh, Italian, right? Yeah, he's Italian, yeah. He so, did a lot of European movies. Right, but here he didn't command so much power that he could just say, let's make a $50 million picture, you know, 
know, anything like that. So he kind of tried to rein it in a little bit and, and thereby diminishing the Oliver Stone vision of this epic, what today would be like a Lord of the Rings, the Rings type, type of thing, yeah. you know, but obviously that's 30 years too early. Now, from what I understand, even John Milius, he wasn't too familiar with the material. He was familiar with the paintings and the pictures, the legend of Conan, but not so much the literature of Conan. He wasn't too up to date on that stuff. Yeah, see, everybody seems to know Frazetta's artwork. I mean, anybody who's into comic book sci-fi, you look back at Frazetta's work. His work is unbelievable. And that's what really got him started. A lot of the fantasy type work was doing the Conan covers. He did all the covers of the books, all the paperbacks. Uh, he was an actual illustrator and he did have some cartoons back in the 40s or 50s. And I don't remember which ones they were, but he was actually published and he slowly got into the fantasy artwork. I think it was in the early 70s. Uh, it was a really cool documentary in Frazetta that PBS shows it every once in a while. That oh, wow. It just goes through his whole life story. So you can see how he goes from doing cartoons to what he became famous for was doing all the Conan shots. And But it's really cool if you do get a chance to see it. Now, the artwork from what I've seen, it's also very sword and sword. It doesn't go one way or the other. It mixes it up really incredible imagery and just fighting and, and that sort of thing. Right. It goes in both directions. Now, the writer, from what I was hearing also, he seemed to be a little out there, too. He wasn't just a straight writer in terms of, here's your story. Milius was talking about how he heard that the writer was writing the stories of Conan, and he, he thought, or he or the myth is that he pretended or thought that Conan was standing by him and, you know, threatening him or something, that if he didn't finish writing on a certain thing, he would have to do something. And it seemed a little weird, the backstory of the writer. Is he kind of like Tolkien in terms of he goes way over sometimes? Yeah, no, nah, I wouldn't compare him to Tolkien. I think he was just a little paranoid, <laughs> a little crazy. Crazy as in just something mentally wrong. That's the way I got it out of the interview, too. Uh, but yeah, don't, not Tolkien. Don't compare him to Tolkien. Tolkien was more, you know, he's Oxford teacher. Okay. He sat and created this guy's his own more language. Out, more he out created there. a history because he felt for his book to be alive, mm -hmm. you needed that backstory. I think Robert E. Howard was just more of crazy and thinking that his character is actually standing behind him. Now, the movie starts to take place and starts to be put together and Milius is in charge and one of the persons I believe he hired was Ron Cobb, who if you're in, you know, into the genre, especially science fiction field, this is a name that shows up a lot as a production designer. He's the guy who draws all that stuff before they build it and it's amazing. I've seen his name pop up in tons of films he's kind of like sit me alien he shows up and it's the same two people always especially in the 80s always drawing all this stuff like i said alien or 2010 all these guys are always showing up in these films and blade runner same thing these two people always show up but ron cobb apparently was the one in this film now let's talk about the actors tell me about tell me about what you know or what you knew at the time of those actors the chief actors in the film Nothing. Do you have no idea who Schwarzenegger was? I don't remember back then who Schwarzenegger was. Well, it's interesting it's, because in Hollywood, the only thing he was known for was Pumping Iron. Which I never saw. Which was a documentary from what I understand. It wasn't a dramatic piece. Now, he no, had done was, other films, but they were very minor. This technically was his breakout film. Yeah, he did also that Hercules in New York City. Right, which really was kind of comedy, but again, it wasn't a big, it was something kind of quickly was nothing. forgettable. Yeah, especially the documentary about bodybuilding. So I don't think that would be a big hit. So I never heard of who Schwarzenegger was and just until I saw the movie. Same as Sandal Bergman, all that jazz, I never saw it. I wasn't big into dance movies. And Jerry Lopez was a surfer. He was a buddy of John Milius. Right. So some of the bigger actors in the film, you've seen them before. I mean, like you have somebody like uh, James Earl Jones, obviously probably the biggest name in the film at the time Darth Vader For himself voice, yeah. and just about a ton of stuff well yeah uh, I mean, he's been around a long time Max von Sydow who played the king who apparently from what we understand was a replacement actor because Sterling Hayden if you've seen any of the Kubrick films he's a big guy uh, who apparently got sick they said and he couldn't do this role so they ended up going with Max von Sydow and even Mako he was an actor that showed up in a lot of 70s. He's a bit he was, actor. He's been in MASH. He's been just about in every 70s. Whenever they needed uh, an, an Asian, Asian character, whether Japanese, Chinese, whatever, it doesn't matter. They always go for him. The guy always looks exactly the same. He like he never ages. But uh, he shows up too, and that's the only time you might see somebody that's like, well, that guy, that guy looks a little familiar. But yeah, for the most part, if you think about the main players at that time, they were really pretty unknown. Uh, not really uh, big. 
And again, if you've heard from Milius, and I had actually the pleasure of meeting Sandow Bergman mm -hmm. in convention at Chiller Theater in New Jersey. It was uh, just last year. Uh, same as Ben Davidson. Uh, they both said that John Milius, he wanted people that were physically fit athletes. She was a dancer. And that's why they were picked. He just didn't want any old schlub off the street and known actors. He was picking people that knew they could do that, uh, all that physical work and looked the part. You had to realize when you, Schwarzenegger got that role, why? Because he was big, muscular. Right. I couldn't imagine this movie having tons and tons of dialogue written for Conan, for the character of Conan. And then when they all of a sudden they realize it's Schwarzenegger, then paring it down to almost nothing. That's the way the role is. That's the way the character is. He's not a talker. <laughs> yeah, he's a physical presence, not a vocal presence. Which is a perfect role, at least for the beginning of Schwarzenegger's career. You take something like this. You take something like The Terminator. Very little lines. Not many lines. It's all physical. It's all attitude. Perfect for him. Right. He's a big, imposing figure. And when you look at Frazetta's artwork, Conan's big, muscular, carries a sword or a giant axe. Mm -hmm. You can't have a Tom Cruise, a wimpy little guy, picking up swords. He's got to be somebody that's big and bulky. And you don't want to go too crazy on Sandow Bergman's side as the female role. You don't want somebody that's so muscular. Right. And I think that's why she worked well as a dancer. She can do all those moves. She was very pretty. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, she was tough. And they all had to go through that boot camp type of thing where they have to train with all these ancient weapons. and It would sword play. And, and also not only learning to use the equipment, but remaining in shape, in that shape that they're expected to be in. And not so much a bodybuilder shape, but a Just like a warrior fit. kind of shape, you Just know. No, it's, physically it's, fit, right? No right. no fat. Uh, and the neat thing, too, is when I got to meet Sandow Berg, when I sent to her, I heard rumors that, you know, you almost lost your finger during filming. She jumped up right away and says, look at this. And mm. she pulled both of her fingers, and you can see how one's just not, it's not right. And she goes, yep. She goes, I almost lost it. Got rushed down to the doctor, the hospital, everything. It was true. So if you hear it on the documentaries, it is true. And you can been, ask her about it. It's been confirmed, and you've seen and, it. You've and seen I've the seen scars. It, and I have a picture of me and her and an autograph <laughs> to prove it. Uh, also, Ben Davidson was another guy, just another quickie. He did get injured. He's one of the thugs, the filming. one he of was... uh, Balls of Doom's thugs, right? right? Yeah. But anyway, he got injured in one of the scenes where the sword breaks away at the end of the, the film. It was an actual metal sword. When it shattered, a piece of the metal goes flying and it cuts his arm. <laughs> and I told him, if you look at the movie close enough, you can see the shard fly. The only thing he knows is he said after filming it, boom, he looked down and now he's got blood and he ended up getting a couple stitches. Um, he's another guy too. Anybody out there, you get a chance to get to Chilla Theater or any other convention ask him he was so happy to talk about the film and he said he had a ball on it and he answered all my questions i spoke to him for like 20 minutes wow it was really cool then i said all right let me keep the line moving i didn't want to keep up too much of his time and even sandow bergman was happy to talk about it they were two great stars to just to sit and remember their roles it's amazing that this movie is almost 30 years old yep. at least since they shot it and it's a good thing that some of these actors are still making the round i mean forget schwarzenegger you're never going to get near him but yeah but Not even gonna get the, the secondary characters, they're still out there. A majority of them working the rounds. Yeah, there was another woman, I forgot her name. She was floating around too. The one that played the witch? Yeah, I think the witch. Valerie Quenenson. Okay. They, they've they been making the rounds in the U.S. You see them every once in a while, they pop up. Now, yeah. going back to the film, apparently they were shot in Europe, and for some reason they started shooting in Yugoslavia, but they had to switch because they were afraid that the political climate wasn't too good back in, the I guess, the, the early 80s. And they ended up shooting a lot of the movie in Spain. Which, I guess it's good in a way because they get a mixture of, you know, the locations are, you, you, you had a little bit of everything. You have desert, you have forests, you have just about everything there. And it and it shows. It looks, it doesn't look like it's in a studio or in a set. That stuff looks very authentic out there. Not jungle, but very wild kind of deserted, it, desolate again, areas. Because that's what they went for. You look at that movie, we always say, joke around, yeah, Schwarzenegger couldn't speak. But that wasn't the point of the movie. That was a visual movie. I always looked at it as, as Frazetta's artwork was visual. They tried to make the movie visual. And the music, which Basil Pildoris did, which is, again, one of my top five to ten favorite soundtracks of all time. No, but you're right. The score is. This is one of these kind of movies where not just the actors, not just the story, there are other elements of the film that are just as important. Some movies don't matter. Some movies you can get away with, yeah, whatever. They shot it here, they shot it there, it doesn't matter. This movie, the locations is part of the story. The locations are very important and very wide, very long shots, establishing shots where you see these epic looking. Now, it might not be real epic, but it looks epic. It, it looks epic because again, it's a movie that was made to be watched in the theater. 
You go back, a lot of old movies were meant to be seen on a big screen, not the little dinky TVs. And yes, we got 42 inches, 52 right. inches. It's not. You need to see it on the big screen, and Conan was one of it. And I think that's where a lot of people lose the point of that movie. It's not, oh, look at all the muscular guys running around, oh, look at all men half naked. That's not the point. And, and, and I've heard lot, comments like that And they've from made other a lot podcasts. of movies. I don't know if you want to call them imitators, but they've tried to make movies like this before, and you're looking at them, and you're like, yeah, that's a set. Oh, yeah, look at those fake rocks. Oh, there's styrofoam over there. And this looks authentic. It's like an archaeological dig. You're like, wow, look at that. Yeah, they went out. Everything was real. Like I said, there's nothing computer generated. They do have some computer generated, these spirits. Some animation. And, and the animation. Because there wasn't even, there was no CGI then. We were, we were not dealing right. in that at not this point. Not much CGI. There was, though, where Conan, he's injured and the spirits are trying to pull him away. And Sandow Bergman, Valeria has to fight away. Those ghosts. The ghosts, but they yeah, do that's come animated. in. That's animated, right. but that's really it. Everything else. Is... It's funny because you watch the movie and you could say, well, this could have been done better this way and this could have been done better that way. But for example, they were talking about the snake. The snake, again, no CGI. Today, that whole thing would have been, been CGI. CGI. And it would have looked pretty good probably, but then they couldn't do it. You can kind of tell that the snake doesn't move that fast or that it, it doesn't flex as, as much as it should. But the fact that he's touching it and it's got some power to it, it gives it reality. And you're shooting real arrows into it. Right. And there's blood coming out of right. it. Right. It's not CGI inserted blood. It's all physical effects, physical and mechanical effects to make that effect work. And even at James Earl Jones, when he turns into the snake, it's Tulsa Doom, it, they did it nicely where it's a rubber mask, pushes right. out, looks like it's moving. But and then it's they, an old style. They jump to the next spot where it's now a, it's a snake. It, right. Head. And this is that is the end of the, I don't know if you want to call it the golden age of makeup effects, because th that kind of reminds me of, if you remember American Werewolf in London, the scene where where you actually see the face right. and it's and it's done in a similar fashion. You have to push the so mask with the something mask else out. and then you cut away and then you come back to it and then you have another mask a little more... I mean, it's an old trick. It's the old Wolfman trick, if you it's think about right. it. But it's the best that it got up to that point. When you got to the mid-80s, it was like, okay, we're done with these physical effects. We're in CGI world now. We don't need to push the envelope anymore. And again, knowing too that the last podcast I, I did, and I talk about being a big Godzilla fan, the people who did those special effects, that was all physical effects. They made the costumes. They made the buildings, everything. Why? To make it look real. You know, and that's where people just look at those, again, those movies as that. Ah, they're cheap it's a man in a rubber suit but that's not special effects that's all physical it's things you could touch and, and it takes an artistry to do that mm -hmm. and they still did that on conan they, and it's, it's they interesting wanted to create because it. it's this is one of those arts that because something else takes over for it the art dies at that point in other words it will not progress you could technically say possibly if no cgi were around that kind of special effect would have continued for another 30 years let's say and it would have gotten even better in mechanical in a mechanical fashion or in a you know but it's over you can't you you, it, that's as good as it got and thank you star wars i'm sorry to say it but thank you star wars <laughs> lucas has to come out with these great special effects and it just killed some of that old way of doing things right. i know and people hate me for saying that but i'm sorry you know episodes one two and three they look great but it's all digital right. where's the physical at well, least empire you had models no even with return of the jedi we were still dealing in mechanical we still had mechanical and opticals, with Jabba. but there was no cgi back then they were still being done done with you know rubber bands and chewing gum but that was the beginning point where they started changing no don't get me wrong i still like it because without that we would never have gotten so many other movies right, right. where now we can get all these comic book movies uh, like green lantern that's coming out a lot of cgi but again going back to conan you got it this movie doesn't start any new technology it's using the available tools at the time and it's using them very very well i can't tell you it's unbelievably well but it's it's very well done. Go back to some of these other knockoffs. Uh, we were going down the list of po of other films at that time. Beastmaster. Beastmaster. And well, there was another movie called Sword and the Sword Sorcerer. Sword and the Sorcerer. Again, it's like, uh, what the hell? Yeah, is was, like, I think mm. That's the one with the slide sword. It's like, come it's on. They it's all tried, gimmicky. See, but the other problem I had with those movies, why I always loved Conan more, they took Conan seriously. Oh, it was well. more serious compared to oh, the little ferrets. Oh, they were cute. And he had the tiger and the animal. But it's all cute. Stuff. But again, it's, it's, it's kind of like a per cutesy. this movie's kind of like a perfect storm. You have, like we talked before, we have the locations that are epic locations. You have the perfect lead character 
He's perfect for this role. What can a bodybuilder do? What are you going to make him play an accountant? No, you make him play this this character that is ridiculously unrealistic, but it's perfect for the mythology of that story. Yeah, exactly. And, that, and again, that's why he picked those people. We all know Schwarzenegger wasn't picked for his acting abilities. <laughs> he was picked because he was physically fit. He was a great specimen, if you want to put it that way. Now, that's the film, reason. from what I understand, even though originally... Oliver Stone kind of saw the film as a franchise, you know, multi-chapter. I you think know, that would have been the, great. In the teens, in terms of how many movies they could make, it was obviously diminished <laughs> as the different scripts kept coming on and his vision kept being brought down. But even John Milius was thinking of not necessarily a James Bond type of franchise, but maybe a trilogy, something like that. He was kind of looking forward to being able to do a couple more about him. He's introducing a character, then you got to learn about the character. Yeah, James Earl Jones was saying that the first film is a revenge story. He's he's not it, a it, hero. He's just trying to get revenge. It, yeah. He was the anti-hero because he wanted revenge. And it's also his origin story. How he got the muscles, where he came from, right, it's why... it's a pretty straight story. They're straight. And he, like you said, the next movies would then move on. Now you know who the character was. Right. He said we the second create, one, he was hoping movies. it would be a story of his responsibility to everybody else, let's say. like Because even they, at the end, you see that little tag at the end that he's like King Conan now. Yep. It's like, okay, this is different. And then he was also talking about a third film that could deal more with loyal, you know, between these characters, especially Conan, obviously. But um, unfortunately, we never got to see that for, we didn't for, get the for multiple one. reasons. But we'll get into that. We'll get into that in a little bit. Now, the other point that we that I want to bring up, which you kind of hinted to a little, is that just like the scenery, the production design, you know, the locations, it's it's another part of the movie. This is one of those movies where there's one more aspect that becomes as important as the main characters in the story, and that is the music. If the first thing I think about this movie, when I think of this movie, is obviously Schwarzenegger. The second thing I think about is the music. The music becomes another character. And this doesn't happen often in, in most movies. Sometimes the music is kind of in the background, and yeah, it's there, but it doesn't kind of come in front of you and show itself. This one, it's a character as far as I'm concerned. Tell us about the composer. Basil Poldoris, unfortunately, he did pass away a good five or six years ago. I mean, he did a lot of great scores. He did Robocop. Oh, yeah. Uh, he did Red Dawn. I think it was Lonesome Dove. Blue Lagoon, believe it or not. He did Blue Lagoon. I've seen that movie on HBO a million years ago, just to clarify that I did not go to the theater to see it. Yeah, I saw it on TV. And too. I cannot remember the music for it. And I don't know if I want to see it now to, because I could not imagine what could this man do with a movie like that. Yeah, I can't imagine it either, but he did. He was the composer. Uh, the only thing I would say is I agree. I have never seen it. I have yet to see that movie since it first came out in the early 80s. And I have not seen it since, but it would be interesting to see. But just going back to your point, for me, the music was another great thing of that movie. Because if you listen to the score, he starts with the opening scenes of the raising of the village and the killing of all the people. And even the forging of the sword, it's all loud trumpets and horns. Right. It's sitting the pace of the film showing that it's brutal. It's axes and hammers against shield and the violence. Of boom, 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 and, and he the, incorporates the unusual sounds into the score. And the score kind of has a... It's not a traditional score it's very they mentioned it's very operatic, operatic and, and very yep. ethnic sounds you know depending on what regions he's visiting you notice the sound changes you hear sometimes like kind of middle easterny stuff and sometimes you hear kind of asian stuff the score moves like the locations change follows along the story and it goes from very harsh to very soothing right a lot of violins uh, and he uses the full orchestra. I always remember where Conan leaves Valeria and Basil Poldoris has that cue and the score going on in the music. And it goes to like, a, there's an oboe, just a note, just quivering. And just imagine she's just lost her lover. He's left. She's alone. And you got that one note that just hangs there, quivering as if she's crying. And then it goes out to the big expanse of Conan out on the horse. And behind him is just the, the sky, the Very mountains. sweeping. And sweeping yeah. at the epic. And that's why I thought Basil Poldoris did such a great job. He, he'll go from one end to the other. Because normally you would never expect to go from there to a battle scene music-wise. Those are two different scores. Brutal battle scene. The music is almost as brutal as what you're seeing. It's a very pounding drums and, you know, and then you go through these... pace. Right. Then you go through these very soft, melodic uh, exchanges. And and then he did use Latin in The Raiders of Doom. Uh, Starlog actually put out an article many years ago that had the translations (laughs) of what... What they were singing. Oh, I'm going to have to look that up. And I have it, and I I don't know what I ever did with it, but I always remember finding it. 
Um, but it went in from if, that. If there, there was, was only there was a chance, if there was only a device where you could enter a question and it would go into some kind of web and look for the answer, oh, maybe we'll do that. We have to do that later. We have to on. try that out. See I gotta find that. But yeah, just the music too. You hear this chanting and the, the horses coming down and the raiding the village. And even the ending of the Battle of the Mounds. Well, that wraps it up for part one of our Conan the Barbarian special. Please join us again next week, where we will continue with part two, and we'll explore such things as Conan the Barbarian on television, merchandising for the film, and the future of the franchise. Please join us again. See you next time on Geek Fest Rants. So grant me one request. Grant me revenge. And if you do not listen, then the hell with you.